an uh, intro song. Doing this <sighs> okay, well, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I think we've had a few of these faces already on the stage, so you're familiar, at least some of you. Um, from my point of view, I think getting to and through growth stage as a startup is a Herculean task. It's, it has a lot of challenges just in and of itself. But when you're a startup that is based on technology and research in the emerging tech side of things, very disruptive, particularly with artificial intelligence and machine learning, I, I think the case becomes all the more great. Um, so when you see these panelists right here, you're seeing startups that have gone through many lessons learned. And I think what we'll do right now, starting with you, Doug, is get into what are like the top three lessons that you think you have to face, not as a startup that has um, become growth stage, but now at this point in time, at the rapidly growing period of your, of your company, what are the most biggest difficult challenges being an AI startup rapidly growing? So let me talk about one of those, because if I talk about three, it could go on for a little bit. Okay. Um, so I think one of the things very interesting, clearly LeadSpace was founded in Israel. And Israel has an incredible strength in data and intelligence. And as we know, a lot of great companies have been founded in Israel. But what's hard is our customers, you know, the Microsofts, SAPs, and so forth, are all based in the US. And so we, first, we had to build an office in San Francisco, which is where I'm based and where we are. But how you bridge that gap, right? Because I think, you know, I have this description that we often will have the engineers in Israel come up with some new algorithm for some way to match a company to a person. And they think this is brilliant because it performs 2% better than the last thing, the last model that we built. But when you deploy that into production, then what happens is your customers who've built their whole processes based on the old way of doing things aren't ready for this black box model that changes everything. And so that balance between you know, being super smart techie geeks 10 hours away from the customer and figuring out how to drive that into actually how business use cases get done with customers is something that once you get beyond sort of proof of concept and so forth is, is really a, an important challenge for us to face. Absolutely. Do, do you agree? I mean, what, what are, I'm not going to give you number three, but what is the number one biggest challenge right now on your plate? On my plate right now. Sorry. Keep losing this. Uh, hope you can hear me now. Um, on my plate right now, uh, scaling the organization. Yeah. So we're, uh, we're just under 50 in the team at the moment. And uh, a lot of my thinking right now is sort of how do we go from 50 to, well, whatever the next level is. Um, and um, yeah. It's, it's so when we're talking about hiring, are we talking about a real hard, challenging way to find the right talent and the blends of talent and, and specific specialties? It's, it's so finding talent is actually not so hard. Like yeah. we, like uh, we operate a, a fully distributed team, so we hire the best person we can find for the job, no matter what location. Uh, which means that every time we put out a, uh, a job, we have like hundreds of applicants in the first week, and um, okay. and so hiring is, is actually finding candidates is actually easy. It's more the the structural organizational side of. Uh, we're still very research heavy, so a third of the team is, is in computer vision, doing sort of the core development. And, uh, and so scaling a tech heavy organization, organization wise, is sort of my biggest challenge right now. Okay. Yeah. And Luca, I mean, you're the meta vision of machines. <laughs> I mean, that is probably as dense as it gets. Tell me there's a, it is a difficulty in finding real like Doogie Howser talent. Talents? Um, Talents is indeed, so we made a, a different choice from, compared to him because we, we decided to, um, to stay, uh, to build all the team in Paris actually, which make the, the constraint of finding talents in a quite limited ecosystem. Um, but we, we managed to overall to um, have a, a hiring strategy which is global, so actually we tried to find talents uh, uh, world, worldwide and try to, to, to bring them to, uh, to Paris, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is a challenge. But, but the fact that now I think uh, uh, France is moving a lot in, uh, in the area of, of, of startups is, um, 
uh, they are going after the, the, the model of the startup nation uh, of, of Israel. So uh, this is creating a lot of, um, um, is, 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 uh, the government is putting a lot of incentives to actually uh, bring uh, 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 talents to, to, to Paris. And um, yeah, and uh, this has been playing in favor to, to our growth currently. Yeah. But I understand that this is not scalable. Now we are approaching almost 80 people. And uh, it cannot scale as fast as uh, it could uh, scale so far, uh, because anyway, the ecosystem is, remains limited. So we actually recently decided to open also other locations in France, also in Grenoble, but also in the US and, <laughs> and in China. Right, thank you. And Sarah, um, how is your platform actually evolving at this stage in this development, keeping in tune with, with basically customer service as a very high growth sector in general? Yeah, so customer service is an incredible growth sector right now. I mean, businesses are buying. We haven't even had a sales team to date. Uh, so everything has been inbound. We've been purely focused on product. We spend so much time you know, going into the contact centers, watching agents work with our technology, and then like iterating around that. So we've been super product focused to date and building the product to scale quickly. So. And different AI companies, they have different uh, challenges, but I think scalability, you know, cracking uh, almost plug and play, let's say in the dream scenario, AI model uh, that you can onboard super quickly is, is what the market needs, it's what is, what is gonna win the market. So we were focusing super heavily on that in the early stages, and now one of our key challenges is yeah, just building out an initial sales organization. Yeah, so being more aggressive in the market because we can be, because we're confident now that that's what we can do. Yeah. And, and with, you know, in AI specifically, mm. the, you don't have like a, a backdrop and historical like research at your disposal. Everything is disrupted now. Everything is frontier. Yeah. Um, how do you stay in the land of real products when everything is constantly going back and forth between theory and then making it product um, ready in the marketplace? With customer service specifically, uh, the data is really exciting. So you have super granular data that, that is every single conversation that has ever happened across every single channel is all recorded and transcribed and sits in the customer uh, contact centers and you have access to it. So. So that means that you have a really strong advantage from a research perspective because you have a lot of stuff to test your hypotheses on. Um, it is, there is a definite research side and there is definitely a lot of trying to push uh, the boundaries of what AI can do. Something that we are working on constantly is exactly what I talked about, uh, the scalability. So part of our solution is this thing called clustering. What we do is we take the historical data and then we run a deep learning <coughs> model on it that automatically structures it. So it automatically defines, uh, separates it into different buckets and it classifies frequency. Right. And that's new. That's not something that's been done before. So a lot of our research yeah. time is gone on that. Just to, I th just to build on that in AI specifically. So there's a lot of discussion about the AI winter, right? So. <laughs> You know, AI is at, every company is now an AI company, as far as I can figure out. Um, and the challenge that we have, I think all of us, is not like what's the cool next whizzy thing that we can produce, right? But how do we show real business results, mm. right? Because I think, you know, especially in the marketing world where it's like new shiny object, right? Got to buy one of those and one of those. But the only way I think, to your point, that we will be sustainable and drive success is finding a few core use cases that really demonstrate results. If we continue to, to just push on the story, like, isn't it cool that, fill in the blanks, I think we're going to be in a position where all of us will out of, yeah. be out of business soon, right? And so I think that's, that's our challenge, is really turning that into something that's real. It's going to be a huge transformation, but there's going to be so many ups and downs along the way. And I think Definitely, as we look at the world, that's what we're very much focused on, is how do we choose those couple of use cases that are AI enabled, not why is AI cool in and of itself? Mm. I don't know. If I fully you... agree, yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's very interesting to be in a growth stage, but it's also extremely challenging in the fact that uh, as long as you, you've been the seed, I think you, you can still afford to be very agile and pivot and find your 
identity as a company for your product, etc. But anyway, you reach a certain size and um, of, of a company, you enter this, this growth stage, so-called. I think you, you start, yeah, I mean, the company becomes so big and you start burning so much money that actually you cannot afford anymore to, to stay open. So you, you have to focus. Um, and, um, and you have to focus on the right product. Otherwise, uh, the risk is that you fail. And the fact that you, we play in this area of AI is, is good because there is the effect of coolness, which brings some hype. And uh, you leverage this hype to, to, to capture money, attention, etc. But the, the counter effect of it is that this is raising all this dust everywhere, because everyone, as you said, is doing AI, right? So, and then, which uh, give you the additional challenge of raising above this, right? Not dust, but let's say this fog, yep. <laughs> and be the one that is, be, is be able to say, okay, I have a unique product, uh, are you gonna buy it, right? What do you yeah. do in terms of hiring and human resourcing and growing so fast in terms of employee count? How do you keep a, a semblance of company culture intact when you're growing this fast? Is there any secrets you can share? Uh, it is difficult, uh, but uh, I, I committed myself actually to up to, if we get that point, but up to 100 employees to be always in the, in the loop of, uh, of the hiring process, at least with a half an hour call, because this, this gives at least, uh, I, I want to, to, to convey uh, as a co-founder of the company the, the, the main values uh, I strive for and I would like to, uh, the company to, to be built on. Um, and I keep uh, having uh, regular sessions with uh, uh, the entire company or subgroups uh, to, to, convey, uh, to convey this. It's, it's difficult, I understand, uh, but um, I think it's important uh, to, to, to keep this, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this culture intact for at least uh, um, the next two, three years yeah, before. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same, same for us, actually, where... Uh, in the initial phases, culture was implicitly built into how you treat each other, how you operate, and everyone understood it. But now we're at a stage and we're growing so fast that we actually explicitly talk about it in our all hands or in our off sites. Like we sit down the whole team and we talk about like, here are our values, here's what we think, here's how we operate, uh, and here's how we treat each other uh, explicitly, uh, just to, to make sure everyone understands. Yeah. Right, and Sarah, do you have anything to add? I, I was just thinking, I have a friend who was an, in the early, early team of LinkedIn. And what they did at LinkedIn is they had goals, which was the number of uh, users that they had on the uh, platform. And every time they reached the next milestone, so 10,000 or 25,000 or 100,000, everybody got a t-shirt and they all had a big party. And I think if we, I mean, I took a lesson from that so personally. You make your goals, each milestone, really, really public. And then you track publicly within the company how you are progressing towards those goals. And each of those goals have to be goals for us. They have to be goals that every team will influence, OK? So they could be revenue goals. They could be user goals, whatever. They could be uh, you know, the amount of savings that you've generated for a client goals but you have to celebrate those successes. I think that, for us, is helping us, because we, we have a remote team as well. It really, really helps us maintain consistency and culture and mission. Yeah. Right. Doug, has, at this current stage, have you, have you, has it changed your relationship with clients, how you interact with them? Are there any lessons you've learned in terms of how to handle them, particularly in this type of sector as you're in right now, compared to when you first started out? Yeah, I guess that um, I've been lucky in my previous, if you look at a company like Salesforce, you come like Skype, they have been so referential based, right? And so, and I think that's so true, at least in the enterprise space. You know, we will talk a lot about what do we do in terms of going out, but really our ability to get customers to talk on our behalf mm. is what it's all about, right? And it's amazing to me both how many backdoor references happen that you're completely unaware of. And then secondarily, when you think that you did all the good work of going and getting a customer, when you really talk to them, it was somebody else who brought them into you. So, right. so we focus very hard on how do you get those 10-pole customers? How do you get those people who both 
will see results, but also talk about success for you. And I think that's got a little bit easier as we got bigger. We're now in the stage of actually how do we scale that from a marketing perspective. Right. I think if you, right. especially as a marketer myself, if you jump in too fast with marketing and you just try and build massive brand awareness, I mean, maybe on the B2C side it's a little bit different, B2B, then a lot of the time there's no substance behind it and the buyers are that much more thoughtful and they think through it. And so, especially for us, it's about what's the time that you turn that, mo you know, you can go out and raise a load of money, spend a lot of it, on big stuff, but what is the right time to do that and what's the right way? And I think you know, it's very much where we are in that scaling now is, as we said, we've got those reference customers, you've got the platform, you've hopefully built the product, so if you get a load of people on, then you can scale, and now's the time to do it. And I see a lot of people trying to get ahead of that curve because they've got these ambitious growth targets they can't do, but right. you know, it's all a balance. Yeah, Jan Eric, your company is completely um, in a different space. Are you having a similar experiences? Um, no, I mean, so, so the way we, like when we talk to our customers, it's a mix of large enterprise right. deals and long tail self-serve customers. And, and similar to, I guess, Slack and other companies where there's like big enterprise deals and then there's like come and buy it uh, without talking to us on the other end of the spectrum. Um, but we don't, I mean, we're, we're too early. We don't have sales. We don't have any more, right. like, we have one person doing marketing right now, so it's like, it's like we're not in that phase uh, at the moment, no. Well, listen, we have about a minute and a half left. I'd like to kind of put you guys in a perspective that if you could you know, send a message to your past self right at day one, maybe a little bit later, first round of, of seed round, if you could send one piece of advice to that person um, because you don't have that much bandwidth in the message. Okay, but you want to give them something key or something to help them along the journey. What would it be, starting from you, Sarah? Put you on the spot. Yeah, I mean, that's a <laughs> tough one. I would, yeah, looking back, I would say, I would just send the message that it's all gonna, <laughs> it's all gonna work out. <laughs> yeah, because okay. you work so hard. Yeah, I don't know about you guys, I work so hard. So, yeah, um, yeah. Just telling you that it's all going to work out and take it easy. <laughs> okay. Luca, yeah, you've yeah. had more time to think. <laughs> I tend to agree with that. It's, it's true that uh, especially at the beginning, you, uh, it's difficult actually to, to, to uh, define the boundaries between your, your professional and your personal life because um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it, it, I mean, the, 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 the entrepreneurial project becomes a lot for you. So uh, you don't have any more any Saturday, any Sunday, and this is... Uh, become to the detriment of, of, of the family, I guess. Um, so I would probably say the same. And what I would also tell myself is that um, um, I think it's important, uh, especially in a space like we are, uh, where the market is growing very fast, to uh, be extremely fast and don't hesitate to uh, get early money, to, uh, to raise early money, to actually expand the team uh, and hire talents that can help you in the journey to to build the right product, to focusing and, and uh, build the customer traction early, early on in the initial phase. All right. Well, well, guys, actually, we're out of time. <laughs> I'm so sorry to cut you off. Um, but thank you, everyone. Um, and we'll begin the next panel shortly. All right.